Okay, got it. Well, all we have left in Chapter 23 to go over together is to look at exactly how the enzymes work on the different molecules in our body. Now, I saved it till the end because hopefully by now you know all the structures. So when I say structure names, it's not going to be a, a big confusion to you know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's really important that as we go through this, you're keeping up with not only what we're digesting, but where in the body this would be occurring. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the chemical digestion of the different molecules, and then we'll look at the absorption of the different molecules. So chemical digestion means we're going to be using an enzyme to take some big molecule and break it down into little pieces. What does absorption mean? Taking it out of the intestines and putting it into the blood so it can travel through the body and be used in different areas. Okay. I'm going to do a little bit of drawing and writing that I don't usually do. We're going to start that way and then we'll move back to the notes. It's all written in your notes, but sometimes I think when I draw it out and also when you write it down, sometimes it makes a little bit more sense. All right. So we have four major macromolecules, big things we have to digest in the body. What would those be? Carbohydrates, which are sugars, good. Fats, proteins, and lipids and fats are the same thing. Nucleic acids, DNA, RNA is your other big group. Okay? And I think I said this in your last class period. Do you eat DNA and RNA? People a lot of times will like kind of curl their nose and go, ooh, gross, no. Yes, you do. If you eat anything eukaryotic, which would be a plant or an animal, eat DNA and RNA. So you've got to be able to break that down too. All right, so let's start with the breakdown of our sugars. I'm going to write a word that I'm pretty sure you guys have seen before. You guys ever seen that before? Yeah, it's a polysaccharide. That is the name of a sugar. Poly means many, saccharide means sugar. Okay? So whenever you eat something, so we've got to come up with something we're going to eat today. Let's say we're going to eat, we're going to eat a bunch of candy. So we're going to eat some Halloween candy. It is going to be a mixture of several different sugars all hooked together, right? So what we would have, all sugars are ring structures. What makes the sugar different is all the different stuff hanging off of that ring. But every single polysaccharide is going to be one ring hooked to another ring, so on and so forth. What makes it poly is that there's many of them stuck together. Okay? This molecule is way too big for you to absorb into your blood and use. What do we need to break it down into so we can absorb it and use it? Think about what you always learn. What do you start with in glycolysis and Krebs cycle and all that? What molecule do we need? Glucose. Glucose looks like this. It's one ring by itself. So glucose is an example of a monosaccharide. Okay. Mono means one. So we got to have some way of enzymatically using an enzyme to break that down. It does not happen in one basic step. It takes more than one. Okay? Our first step is going to just cleave off or break off a few of these little rings at a time. Okay? The first enzyme we're going to use to do that is called amylase. Okay. Where do we have amylase at? Where do we break down sugars? In your mouth. That's one place. So you're going to have salivary amylase. Where else do we have it? Anybody remember? Not the liver. Close. Small intestine is where it works. It comes from the pancreas. Good. Okay. So from the pancreas, and it's going to go into the small intestine. Sorry, my handwriting's so bad. It's hard to write on this. 
Okay? So that amylase in our mouth and in our pancreas just breaks a few of them off. So you'd end up with disaccharides, trisaccharides, meaning you would have still have more than one ring hooked together, but you've taken it from really big, made a little bit smaller. Okay? So somewhere we've got to take and finally get it into this one individual ring. And to do that, we use what are called brush border enzymes. Good. Somebody's in reading. Good. They're called brush border enzymes. That's the name of the big class of them. There are tons of them. We're not going to learn all their names. To give you an example, once all of this has occurred at the top, so amylase has been breaking them down in the mouth, the pancreas squirts out all this stuff, we've been breaking them down in the pancreas, now we're inside of the small intestine. Okay? All these little brush border enzymes are made inside of the microvilli of the small intestine. To give you an example of one, its name is glucase. No, that's not right. Sucrase. So we'll use that one as an example. So this is an example of one of the brush border enzymes. Okay. It's called sucrase. Anytime you're looking at enzymes, you're going to see this ASE on the end, right? It's going to tell you what's breaking down. Now, of course, I'm not making you draw any structures. I'm drawing the structures to make sure you can really see what's going on. So for an example, sucrose is glucose and oh my chemistry teacher would be so mad at me. Is glucose and fructose stuck together. Okay? So inside of the small intestine, when this little disaccharide gets there, there's a specific brush border enzyme called sucrase, which is always in your intestines. We'll break it apart and then we'll finally get that one individual little monosaccharide. Now we can take that one, absorb it, put it in our blood, can go everywhere in our body, and we can use that. Make sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I was trying to do right here was just tell you where it was occurring. So if we start from the beginning, if I put this in my mouth and start chewing, Inside of my mouth, in my saliva, I have amylase. So it's breaking the big ones down into smaller ones. Then I swallow it. Nothing else happens. goes through my stomach. Nothing's happening to my sugar. When that rest of the sugar gets into my small intestine and the duodenum in the beginning, then my pancreas secretes some more amylase into there. I break it down a little more. Then all of it keeps going through my intestines. As it's going through my small intestines, the very specific brush border enzymes like the sucrase or galactase, there's a bunch of them, continue and finally break all of them down into individual little sugars. Does that make sense? Got a good visual of how that's working? Okay. Now let's look at Okay. That didn't really work good, did it? Let's do this way. All right? So it doesn't get tiny. I want it to be big. Now let's look at what we're going to do with our proteins. All right? So what are proteins composed of? Amino acids. Good. Have all these amino acids hooked together. A little bit of terminology. Protein is the name for hundreds of amino acids hooked together. Okay? Whenever you eat a steak, you know you're eating protein, right? Those proteins may be anywhere from a hundred amino acids hooked together to thousands of amino acids hooked together. Okay? So is it going to, are you just going to immediately be able to break that down into individual amino acids? It's going to take time, right? Okay. If we start with these amino acids, I'm sorry, if we start with the proteins, we put them in our mouth and we start chewing them, 
do we start breaking down those amino acids in our mouth while we're chewing? No. There is no enzyme in the mouth to break down proteins. All right? We continue, go through the esophagus, no breakdown. We get in the stomach. Do we start breaking them down in the stomach? Yes. What enzyme do we have in our stomach that breaks down proteins? Pepsin. Very good. Okay. Now, if you think back when we first learned that, I didn't give you the word pepsin. That's not what's written in your notes. That's not what's in your figures from the stomach. It was called pepsinogen. You guys remember that? Okay. Pepsinogen is what we call a precursor enzyme. Okay. So the way it works, your chief cells secrete pepsinogen. pepsinogen. What do your parietal cells in your stomach secrete? Acid, hydrochloric acid. So what ends up happening, the pepsinogen is secreted, the hydrochloric acid is secreted. When you secrete hydrochloric acid, what does that do to the pH? It makes it real, real low, real acidic. As soon as the pH gets low enough, pepsinogen becomes pepsin. All that does is ensure that the pepsinogen does not work until, unless you're in the stomach where the pH is low enough. So that's why you keep seeing pepsinogen and pepsin. Those are the same thing. Pepsinogen is what it's called before it starts working. When it's actually a working enzyme, it's called pepsin. Don't let that throw you off. It's the same thing, just a little bit different terminology. Okay? So in our stomach, pepsin, We'll start working on it, start breaking it down, okay? but it's not going to completely finish the job. It's going to take a protein and break it down into polypeptides. Again, your textbook loves to give you terminology, just throw you off. Polypeptides are shorter proteins. So instead of having hundreds of amino acids hooked together, you may now have 30 amino acids hooked together, three amino acids hooked together, various different lengths. So you just, what you did in your stomach was take these long, gigantic proteins, start breaking them down. But you're not done because you've got to get it into individual amino acids to be able to absorb it in your small intestine. So we need to do something. Now, to finish the job and get it into an individual amino acid. We're in our small intestine. Where do we get enzymes from? From the pancreas again. And these are going to be called proteases coming from our pancreas into our small intestine. Now, in your textbook and in your notes, you're not going to see protease. You're going to see trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase. Those are examples of proteases. Why do we need so many different ones? Are all amino acids the same? No. There are 20 different amino acids. So you have to have a bunch of different proteases. They're very specific. Carboxypeptidase will only break it down if there is a specific amino acid that it sees. So it goes and finds that amino acid and then cuts. Well, since there's a lot of them, then you need trypsin to come find a different amino acid and cut. So that's why you see all those different names. You don't have to learn them all, but you need to understand when you're seeing them that those are the different names for all the enzymes that break down the proteins into individual amino acids. Good. Now you know it. You haven't forgotten the answer. It took you several tries. That's the goal. Does that make sense? Okay. Do our next one. That's not the right button. Okay. Now let's do student nucleic acids next. There are two types of nucleic acids in your body. What are they? DNA and RNA. Make sure you know what that means when I write that down. What makes DNA and RNA different? 
Uh, yeah, okay. That's true. DNA is usually double-stranded. RNA is usually single-stranded. But when you're, think about an enzyme. The enzyme doesn't know whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded. It's just looking at molecule, like. What, is the, what does the D stand for? Deoxy. So what does deoxy mean? D means without. Oxy means oxygen. The only difference on a molecular level between those two molecules is the presence of an oxygen. Okay? Otherwise, they're almost exactly the same. The only reason I'm pointing that out to you is to prove to you they're so similar, we actually don't need very many different enzymes to break them down. In your digestive system, you treat DNA and RNA very, very similar. Okay? So it actually makes them closer together. All right. So we've got a bunch of nucleotides. I'm just going to write in for simplicity. Cause, okay. A bunch of different nucleotides together. Well, some of them are, are oxygenated, some of them aren't. Either way, we're going to treat them the same. All these nucleotides stuck together. Do we do anything to this in our mouth chemically? No. Stomach? No. Nothing happens to your nucleic acids until you get into the small intestine. Very, very simple breakdown. This is probably the easiest one. So we're in our small intestine. Where do we always get our enzymes from? From the pancreas. So our pancreas secretes something into our small intestine to break this down. Oh, I've been putting that in parentheses, sorry. And the name of the enzyme is a nuclease. Okay. That's the simplest one, right? We don't do anything to it chemically until it gets into our small intestine. Now that it's in our small intestine, our pancreas secretes the nucleases. The nucleases start breaking it down into individual nucleotides. That individual nucleotide can be absorbed, and we can start using it in our body. Okay? So what's the only molecule we have left? Lipids. Why do you think I waited to the end to do it? Because it's a little bit more complicated. The only thing that makes the lipid a little bit more complicated, and we've already talked about it a little bit, is because it is not polar. It's hydrophobic. Can a fat dissolve in water? No. Yes. I'm recording it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. All right. So fats don't dissolve in water. Nonpolar. The enzyme that's going to break this down is polar. Does dissolve in water. So they can't naturally interact with each other. We've got to have some help. So the first thing we've got to do is emulsify this fat in order to break it down. Okay? So first off, let's draw a fat. Fat has two major comp parts to it. No, we don't break it, we don't break it down in the stomach. Nothing's going to happen to this until it gets to the small intestine at all. We just it's just floating through. Okay? All right. So there's two parts to it. The part I just circled is called glycerol. And this does matter because when we break them apart, we do different things with them. The little squiggly line is called a fatty acid. Okay? Right? The fatty acid is the extremely nonpolar, hydrophobic part of this. The fatty acids are so much bigger than the glycerol, it makes the entire molecule act hydrophobic, nonpolar. Okay? So what are we going to use to interact with this fat and help it be able to interact with the enzyme? What's our emulsifier in our body? 
file. Okay? So we get our fat in our mouth, we chew it up, nothing happens. Swallow it, nothing happens to the fat. The fat turns around in our stomach, nothing happens. Now the fat's in our small intestine. We squirt two things into that, the area where the fat is. The first thing we put in there is bile. Where does the bile come from? The liver made it, but where did it come from? The gallbladder. So we squirt out the bile, and bile looks like this. Positive on one end, hydrophobic on the other end. Okay. So let me make it a little bit bigger. Where we're, I'm going to show you what's happening. So what happens in your body is you take your fat, I'm going to draw the bile in a different color, make sure you can see what's going on. Okay? So when you squirt out all that bile, all the nonpolar ends of the bile wrap around the fat. So those of you that have been reading in your textbook, we've now formed what's called a micelle. Meaning, we have these little droplets. Okay? The bile finds the fat and says, oh, I need to take care of this. And the bile wraps all the way around the fat. Now the fat's floating around, completely emulsified. This is the only real word for it. Meaning, completely surrounded by all of the bile. Okay? So now what we can do, this is still in the small intestine, we have another secretion, and what do we say always secretes our enzymes? Pancreas. The pancreas is going to release enzymes to break down the fat, and what are they called? Lipases. So here comes the lipase. Lipase is charged, it's polar, it interacts with the positive area, and it can sneak down in here and start breaking the fat down. Lipase cuts right here. Okay. So when that lipase cuts, what do we now have? We have two parts. We have a backbone, which is called glycerol. And we have fatty acids, right? Hmm? Does that make sense? We're going to go through it again. We're fixing to go through the notes. Okay? So let me start from the beginning and make sure you understand. Here's our lipid we ate. It's all connected together. It's just kind of floating around, sitting on top. Can't dissolve in all the secretions in our body. So the first thing is the gallbladder is signal to secrete the bile. The bile wraps around the fat, emulsifies it. Then the pancreas secretes lipase, which is an enzyme. The enzyme can now have access to the fat because the bile wraps around it. So the lipase comes in and starts cutting on the fat. Lipase breaks the fat down into the glycerol and individual fatty acids. Now what are we going to do with that glycerol and those fatty acids? Absorb it. We do not have to break it down anymore. We absorb it just like it is. Okay? All right. Now let's test it and see if you really understand. Those of you didn't like my drawings, I'm sorry. It was an attempt to make it make sense instead of just showing you pictures from the book. All right? This is where we stopped in our notes. So let's go through these. You'll see we've already talked about all of it. Let's make sure we understand what happened to get to this point really quickly. We put the food in the mouth. What happened in the mouth? Mastication. So we mechanically start digesting it, and we secreted the enzymes to break down the sugars. Okay. Then what do we do to it after we chew, finish chewing it? Deglutition, we swallow it. 
goes down, it passes through the buccal phase, through the esophageal, um, pharyngeal esophageal phase. Now how does it move through the esophagus? Peristalsis, good. Do we do anything to it other than just move it through the esophagus? No, just move it. Now the food gets into our stomach. It's not called food right now. What's it really called? Bolus. It hasn't got to the stomach yet, okay? That's just me being a bad teacher. It's called the bolus. So we swallowed the bolus, went through the esophagus, we put the bolus in the stomach, we close the sphincters, and what does the stomach do? Shakes it around, all right? Mechanically digesting the food in the stomach. Also digesting proteins, which is what we're talking about now, too. But mechanically digesting it in the stomach. Now it's not a bolus. It's called chyme. All right. What hormone was secreted that told us to do everything we just did? What hormone tells us to eat something? Gastrin. Good. So the gastrin is what signaled the stomach to start churning around. Now we're finished churning it around. We've got the chyme, and we start squirting it from the stomach into the small intestine. Do we need to keep secreting gastrin? Now that we secrete gastric inhibitory peptide, tells the stomach to quit. But what other hormone do we start releasing now that the food's going into our duodenum? CCK, cholecystokinin. And it has two major jobs. It signals the secretion from what two parts? gallbladder, and the pancreas, so we can digest everything in our small intestine. Good. All right. Now, for digestion of carbohydrates, we do it two places, in the mouth and in the small intestine. The salivary amylase is the one that works in the mouth. Pancreatic amylase works in the small intestine. The brush border enzymes are made where? In the microvilli in the small intestine. Okay. Once we get it small enough into monosaccharides, we can absorb it. So let's look at some pictures. These came from your book and I think they're very good. Okay. So we start with starches, polysaccharides, disaccharides, right? Salivary amylase, pancreatic amylase, breaks it down. Now our little brush border enzymes continue breaking it down into the smallest possible sugars. Okay? Shows you where everything happens. I'm looking for a specific picture. Yeah, quit flipping, let me look something. Okay, well there's not a picture in your book. Okay? We'll keep going. That's what happens how we break down our sugars. Proteins. We have pepsin in the stomach. We have proteases in, coming from the pancreas in the small intestine. Now we have individual amino acids. We're ready to absorb it. Okay. The reason I'm assuming there's not a picture in your book for the sugars is because the sugar works just like the pro amino acid. Okay. This is what I was trying to get to. Now we're ready to absorb it. What is this right here? It's a cell. If we're talking about absorption, where are we at? Small intestine. How else could you know that? What are these little things? There's a little microvilli. Okay? So now this would be true of a sugar or a protein. So just your textbook chose to show you protein. How do we get it from the lumen of the small intestine into our blood? Okay. These are little individual amino acids. It is coupled to sodium transport. Okay. Why does that matter? Well, we've got to have some energy, but here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Here's the little amino acid. It is absorbed, goes through the cell of the small intestine, and then squeezes through and goes directly into the blood, traveling around the small intestine. Why is this called a capillary? Because it's a small enough blood vessel to allow what? Passage into it. Very good. You guys are smart today. You are sharp. Okay? So if this was also sorry, a little tiny sugar that we have finished digesting, 
what would happen to it? It would also find some sodium coming through. And it would tag along. Here would be the little sugar going through the cell of the small intestine. Keeps going, there'd be a little carrier, and that sugar jumps into the capillary as well. Okay? Make sense? I know I'm repeating myself, but I want to make sure you understand everything that happened. Okay? Protein digestion occurs stomach and small intestine by enzymes from the pancreas. Okay? Here's what's going on with the lipids. Pre-treatment requires emulsification by bile. Put that in common, normal words. What does that mean? What does pre-treatment mean? Before I digest it, I need to wrap it up using the bile so that my enzymes can get to it. Only enzyme we have that breaks down a fat is lipase. It comes from the pancreas. After we break it down, we end up with glycerol and fatty acids. Now we've got to absorb them. All right. This is where it gets a little different. Fats are special. The fatty acids are special. They do not absorb directly into the blood. The glycerol does just what we saw with the amino acid and the sugar goes through the cell of the small intestine into the blood. The fatty acids go into the lacteals. Do you remember what those are? Let me flip to the picture. Maybe it'll... What color is it? Green. What, col what are the little green tubes and passageways running through the body? lymphatic. Okay? So this one's different. We take our little fats, we wrap it up with bile. That way the lipase can get to it. Lipase gets to it, breaks it down into little fatty acids. These little fatty acids kind of follow the same path. They go through one of the cells of the small intestine. But instead of going into the blood, the fats go into the lymphatic system. Why do we have to treat those fatty acids different? How are they different? What have we been talking about? They can't dissolve in water. So all that other stuff can easily dissolve, go through one of the cells in the small intestine and go directly into the blood. These fatty acids are nonpolar. They can't act just like everything else can. So they have to travel a little bit differently and go into the lacteal, into the lymphatic system. But is that okay? Can they eventually get to the blood if they get into the lymphatic system? Because what does the lymphatic system ultimately do? Travels up, empties and dumps into the subclavian veins, and now it would be part of the blood supply. Okay? This is something they love to ask you on standardized tests because it's kind of a trick. Right? It's the only thing that does not absorb directly into the blood. It goes into the lymphatic system, but it will ultimately make it to the blood. That's why I'm pointing it out to you, because they love to give you a trick question. Okay? So first we have unemulsified fats. The liver makes the bile stored in the gallbladder. CCK signals it to be secreted out. Then the lipase can interact and we break it down. Okay. Nucleic acids, we have the nucleases. Break them down individual, into individual nucleotides. Just a lot of the same pictures. Happens in the small intestine. Okay. Then we would absorb them. Last couple things we need to talk about. Other than the sugars, the fats, the nucleic acids, and the proteins that we've eaten, we've eaten other stuff that is good that we need to absorb, right? We don't want to just poop it all out. What happens to the stuff we can't absorb, the stuff that's not good? Where does it go after the small intestine? 
large intestine, and we get rid of it, right? But there is stuff other than the sugars, the fats, the proteins, the DNA, and the RNA that we want to keep. There's two major categories, the electrolytes and then the water. The electrolytes are absorbed in the small intestine. They are absorbed and go into the blood, just like most things other than fats. Okay? Main things you need to be aware of that we absorb. What's this the abbreviation for, or the symbol for? Sodium. Okay? Iron. What's this one? Potassium. Calcium. Okay? All of these, along with some other minor electrolytes, are absorbed in the small intestine. Okay? The other one is the water. Where do we absorb the water? We absorb some of it in the small intestine, and then we continue to absorb it in the large intestine. Okay? That's all your PowerPoint notes. I know there's a lot of them. So let me ask you some example exam questions and see if you can answer them. I'll even write them down. I too, I'll type them since my handwriting doesn't look good on here. Alright, so first question, let's see if you guys can get it right. Sorry, I'm trying to get my computer to function. Okay, here we go. Let's answer that question. The majority of carbohydrate absorption occurs in the small intestine. Okay, so why is that tricky? Because I'm also going to ask you this question. Wait, that's wrong. It takes me a while to make your test. I'm sorry trying to do this on the fly. It's kind of difficult. All right, what's the answer to that? Chemical digestion of carbohydrates occurs in the mouth. Is that the only answer? And small intestine. Okay? I could ask you something else. I could ask you amylase is produced by the what? Pancreas and good. Salivary glands. Do you see the point I'm trying to make by asking these three questions? They're all about what? Carbohydrate digestion, right? But you need to very clearly be able to tell the difference between absorption. If I ask about where does absorption occur, small intestine. If I ask you where does the chemical digestion occur? It occurs in the mouth and in the small intestine. But if I ask you where the enzyme amylase that breaks down the sugars is made, the answer is pancreas and salivary glands. Okay, so you've got to be able to put them all together. Okay, so if we so that would be carbohydrates. All right. Let's do. I'll put these on the blackboard if y'all want me to. Yes, yeah, have to remind me. Let's do the proteins. Okay, and I'll just change words. Where does the majority of protein absorption occur? I heard stomach. Is that the right answer? Small well, intestine. You do not absorb. And that's so commonly missed. You do not absorb in the stomach. You don't absorb until you get to the small intestine. Okay? I think I told this class, maybe it's the other class, there is something you can absorb in the stomach, but it's not anything good. What is it? Alcohol. 
You can absorb alcohol in your small in your stomach. You don't absorb any good stuff till you get your small intestine. The chemical digestion of protein occurs in the where? Where do you chemically digest proteins? Stomach. Anywhere else? And small intestine. Okay. Pepsin is produced by the what? Not the pancreas. Chief cells of the what organ? Stomach. Yeah, I'm studying today. Okay. Proteases are produced by the what? That's the pancreas. Okay. Now we have an appreciation for why I saved this for the end to make sure you can see how it all fits together, right? Okay. Everybody's understanding, right? If you're not, you're going to tell me. What would be next? Let's do lipids. The majority of lipid absorption occurs in the, what's the answer? Small intestine. This is the only answer that doesn't really change. Okay. Chemical digestion of lipids occurs where? Where do you, where do you chemically digest your lipids? Small intestine. Good. Lipase is produced by what? Pancreas only. Does that make sense? Um, I'll probably just re-upload the notes, and I'll just have this added to the end of them. So you can just go in and grab the extra ones if you want them, look at them. This, the reason I'm doing this with you was, one, to show you how it can be confusing. But also, you should be able to sit down and think of this yourself. All right? Sit down next time you're eating while you're studying. Put some in your mouth and think about every little thing that's going on as you go through. I, you guys know the anatomy by now, all right? Yeah, most of you have a lab test today on anatomy of the digestive system, right? So that means that if you haven't studied anything but anatomy yet, you have two full days to make sure you understand all of the physiology that's going on, right? All right, guys, you need to tell me what you want me to go over with you again. All right, good. Question. Okay. <laughs> That's not fair. Y'all make me stand up here and say the words. Y'all should have to say them. The reason the study questions ask for three phases is because I wrote those last semester a year ago when I first, and we had different textbooks. They used to separate it into swallowing into buccal, pharyngeal, and esophageal, three stages. This textbook does it buccal, then pharyngeal, esophageal. The only reason I ask you that question is to make sure you understand that with swallowing, there's, one, there's parts of it where you can't breathe. There's parts of it where you can. So you understand during the buccal phase, it's in your mouth. So you could still breathe through your nose while you were chewing and in the process of beginning to swallow. Once you get it past the back of your mouth and it's in the pharynx, can't breathe. Uvula pushes up, epiglottis pushes down. So then what takes over? Your brain. It becomes involuntary until it, and it gets into your esophagus and you can breathe again. So that's my point of asking that question is to make sure you understand part of it you can breathe, you control. Part of it you can't breathe. So it becomes involuntary, your brain takes over. Okay. Anything else? You guys know what to do? Okay. 